Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome again to Sovereign Grace Baptist Church. It's an exciting day here today as we celebrate the welcoming of a couple, uh, two families, well, at least my son-in-law and Ralph and Barb, two families to join us. And, you know, in, in life, there's, there's living life, and, and there's, there's new life. We, we celebrate the life of a newborn baby. We celebrate life every month when someone has a birthday. There's different birthdays. Michelle celebrated her 39th birthday or something of the effect. And we celebrate life. I mean, life is something right to be celebrated, something to be exalted in. I mean, uh, God is creator and God has created us all in his wonderful image. And it is to be celebrated. We should celebrate birthdays, and we should give thanks for what God has given us in different people in our lives. Uh, and on that respect, I want to tell you a quick story about a, a young man. His name is Gary Miracle. And just thinking about life, he, uh, if you've ever heard of the, the gospel group Mercy Me, they're one of my favorite groups, and they have this guy, his name's Gary Miracle, and he's been a roadie for 20 years. And last year in January, his blood became septic. And he ended up going into septic shock. Mm -hmm. And he lost all four of his limbs. He was in a coma for 107 days. He died during this ordeal and was brought back to life. A Christian. And what's amazing through this story, he learned how to truly live life. Uh, there's a song that, that Mercy Me made about his whole ordeal called Tell Me I Won't. Tell Me I Won't. And, and this, he already was a Christian, right? But we know that God works through our struggles and our trials and our tribulations. Say I won't. And, and here he is, no arms, no legs. And he found a new depth to his relationship with God that he never knew existed through this incredible difficulty. Um, he's got a beautiful wife and, and three little children, and they've created arms for him. And throughout this, this video, you see him embracing this trial, but embracing life in a new way. Uh, in the video, he ends up having arms, and recently I understand this whole say I won't, Say I won't walk again. Say I won't, uh, he lost, yeah, his arms and his legs. Say I won't walk again is part of it. A few days ago or a month ago, he walked for the first time on his own, took three steps. And what really struck me about this story is he gave one line to the, uh, the songwriter of Say I Won't, and he said, I have known what it's like to live, but I want to know what it's like to really be alive. And you know, so often we live, but we don't really embrace life the way it's meant to be embraced. And listen, I think there's a real correlation in my sermon here today. We're all born and we all have life and we all live life. But that life is a life where we're dead in sin. And, and then there's even times as Christians that we come to faith in Christ, but we just live life and we don't live it to its full or embrace it for all it's worth. And just in this story of this young man, I want to not just live, but I want to know what it means to be alive. And we've been talking about truth. And in the midst of my sermon here, in the midst of this story, is this idea of real, true life. We've been talking about truth but, but what is at the base of the gospel is new life in Christ. It's, it's, it's being born again and being born again in this last step of truth by the Holy Spirit of truth. And now the Holy Spirit can bring new life into the believer and even new life into a believer that's forgot that this is what real life is like. Because, you know, the, the unbeliever goes, I'm living life now to the full. I'm living in sin, and it's fun, and, and there's things that I'll do that I want to do, and they think they're living life, and all that's really bringing is death. 
Then there's the believer that comes to faith. We turn from our sin. We repent. We turn to God. And then God pours out his Holy Spirit on us so that we might not just be alive, not just live, but really know what it means to be alive. And that's what I want to see here at the base. I was so moved by that story. But it's the true story for every one of us, that there is life to be lived. And we need to live it in such a way that we'll only experience it as we experience it under the influence of the Holy Spirit in a wonderful, wonderful way. So like I said, we've been looking through the, at the idea of truth. Today's my final uh, uh, sermon in this three-part series. The first part of truth was the very truth of the gospel. We talked about how it's important Paul would persuade and he would, he would just fight for, for folks by bringing them the truth. And we as Christians are called to preach the truth and, and, and to give an answer for the hope that's within us. And then we talked more last week about, well, what is truth? The gospel is true. Apollos knew the Old Testament. The Old Testament is true. But the Old Testament isn't made alive until it's brought into the context of who Jesus is. So really, right here, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. This is the book that carries all the truth that we'll need to live on. You know, we talked about you can hear the word of God, so you get a little bit of a grasp on it. You read it, you start to get a better hold of it. You don't just hear it and read it, but you study it. I've got three fingers on it. And finally, you meditate on it, and you've got a full, good grasp of the Word of God. You know how to live life, and you don't you know, know what it means to really be alive? You need to know what's in the pages of this book. And we need to live what's in there. And God now, in this last series, will enable us by the power of of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of truth. God is so good to us to not only forgive us, not only allow that our sins and our iniquities might be covered over by the blood of Christ, but now he's made a way so that we might be filled with the spirit of truth. Our sins kept us separate from God, but now the, uh, through Christ we're brought near again to God and filled with his Holy Spirit. Jesus said this, uh, yeah, if you read the end of the Gospel of John, it's so wonderful. But Jesus said this in the 16th chapter. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own, on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. This last part here, this being immersed in the Holy Spirit, is truly being immersed in truth. But more than that, I think, this truth is life. It's true life. You know, Jesus said you must be born again. You know, the Spirit goes where it wills. You can't see it. You know, you see the wind that blows a tree, but where does it go? But I'll tell you what, you can tell where the Spirit lands by the life that it brings and creates in the life of the believer. So that's what I want to see here today. I want to see, surprisingly, three points. Some truth, immersed in truth, and then testifying to truth. So if you could open with me to Acts chapter 19, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 10. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. <clears throat> I think as we work our way through this portion of Scripture, we're going to see that there's the idea of some truth, there's the idea of being immersed in truth, and then there is the ability to testify to truth. And it happened, while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper region, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. 
Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him. Excuse me. John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about twelve in all. And when he went into the synagogue, and, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed for them from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So in this portion of scripture, just to bring you up to speed, Paul is back. He had gone down to Jerusalem, uh, up to Jerusalem, then down to Antioch, and now he's made his way back to Ephesus. He's beginning his third missionary journey. Last work, week we had Apollos. He has gone off to Corinth, and he is working his ministry as well. But here in this portion of scripture, Paul is delving in to these 12 men. And it really strikes me that Paul's been preaching all over God's green earth. Paul's been preaching to uh, uh, multitudes of people, seeing great numbers come to faith in Christ. But here we are. God has brought Paul to talk to just these 12 guys to try to delve a little deeper and see what the level of truth is that they're walking in. And just through a couple of questions, he's able to really see where their hearts are and what level of truth and understanding they have. You see, it's not enough just to have some truth we'll find out, but we need to have, as the scripture says, and as, as Schaefer says, true truth. Verse 2 there, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we've not mu as much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what, if you've not heard that there's a Holy Spirit, you're missing out on quite a bit. These guys are quite lacking in where they need to be. Uh, but, but there's no doubt they had some truth. Paul goes a bit further. Into what baptism were you baptized? And they say into John's baptism. So they have at least maybe sat and heard the last Old Testament prophet, John. John came into the world to make straight away and prepare the path for the Messiah. He told all men everywhere, repent of your sins and prepare your hearts. So repentance is wonderful. It's some truth. It's some very important truth. It is important that we turn away from our sin. It is important that we repent and ask God to forgive us. But it's not enough. It's some truth. It's a little bit of truth. It's important truth. They understood, maybe as Apollos as well, who only knew the baptism of John. They had a whole understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. They were moving in some level of truth and being very true and honest to it. But some truth is not enough to bring life and eternal life. Some truth is not enough to do the full work of what God has for us. But Paul is going to help him here. So Paul says in verse 4 that uh, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. So there's repentance, and that's good, turning from our wicked ways, but now where do we go with it? Turning towards Christ, believing in Christ, trusting in Christ, trusting that he died, he was buried, that he rose again for my own sins. There's a lot of people living religious lives that repent of their sins all the time. I'm sorry. You know, what is it when your child comes up and, and they've done something and they go, Dad, I'm sorry. Before you can even turn around, they're back doing it again. That repentance is of no real value. Being sorry for our sins is great, but it accomplishes nothing. There's something much more. There's this turning from sin and then this embracing of Christ, 
trusting in Christ Jesus who would come. Repentance is always a change of heart and mind. It's, it's not just a change of heart and mind that we want to get off the path that's leading us down that steep cliff that's going to land us on jagged rocks and smash us into smithereens if we don't turn to Christ. Repentance is good. We're still on that same path. We're still falling, still going to die. But now we turn to Christ and there is rescue. We know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Repenting of our sins and trusting in Christ. That's why we need to know what this says. Because you know what? We need to know what is sin. We need to know what is the will of God for us. What does he call us to do as individuals, as families, as, as a nation? You name it. God lays out a very clear way of how we're supposed to live. What is sin? John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, but Jesus who was to come would save them from their sins. So, so of course, some truth is good, but some truth can just get you in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but where we're headed with truth is we want to be immersed in truth. We want to jump under the water of truth. We want to get saturated in truth. Stephen Curtis Chapman has this cool song that I've rediscovered this week in looking at this sermon, uh, and it's called Dive. And if you want to get into truth, we're called to do what Stephen Curtis Chapman says. I'm diving in. I'm going deep. In over my head, I want to be caught in the rush, lost in the flow. In over my head, I want to go. The river's deep. The river's wide. The river's water is alive. So sink or swim, I'm diving in. We're called, if you're going to believe in Jesus, we have to be all in turning from our sin and diving completely into all that God has for us. And of course, as Baptist, Baptists, there is a real good analogy here. Because when you come to faith, we talked about we've got a couple people joining our church by transferring their memberships. We've got a couple young ones that are joining our church through repentance to sin, faith in Christ, and now we're going to dive them into the waters of baptism and sink them all the way down, and they're going to get soaked from the head to the toe. And that's a real image of being immersed in truth. When they heard this, these guys here, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. We need that some truth of, of repentance. We need the deeper truth that brings us to complete immersion in the truth of the gospel, that brings us to the end of ourselves, that says, you know what? I don't only not want to walk in my sin, but I want to die to my old man, and I want to live this new life that I'm called to. That's what baptism so beautifully reflects. Down in death to self and raised up, in newness of life. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the very great commission that God has called us to. Paul puts it this way in Acts 17, 30 to 31. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. And he's given witness to this, because he rose Jesus, raised him from the dead. And he is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Wonderful thing is, we can be excited about that coming because of repentance, because of trust in Jesus. Turning from sin is not an option. Do you think you get that's an option for all of us? Maybe I'll turn from sin, maybe I won't. It's no option. Either we turn from sin or judgment is going to fall on us. But see, the beauty is in this truth and being immersed in the truth and trusting in this risen Lord and turning from our sin that that penalty and the, 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 the wrath that we deserve because of our sin is poured out on Jesus instead of being poured out on us. And it's something to be excited about. That's truth. That'll start turning your life around where you're just not living from day to day but where you really start to understand what it means to be alive. Alive from death and alive to God. God comes to save us from our sins, to deliver us, and to give us a whole new path to walk on. 
He changes us from the inside out into a completely different person. And it's fantastic. And it's what life is really, really about. And as I said there, Paul being a good Baptist like you and I, he found some water and he baptized those boys. And there's a little aside there. He lays hands on them and they speak with other tongues and they prophesy. It doesn't say speak with other, other tongues. But some use this to say there's a, a second experience as a Christian that you, you believe and then you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. You speak with tongues and now you've really got the power. I don't want to... If, come, come and talk to me. If that's a problem for you, let's talk about that. But honestly, that's referring back to at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on that first 120 and they gave evidence that they were filled with the Holy Spirit by speaking in tongues. It wasn't gibberish. It was the very wonderful works of God that they were declaring. So now these 12 guys are able to completely declare the, the wonderful works of God, that they're, they're transformed, they're now immersed, immersed in the Holy Spirit. But really, and there's so much we could get into, but what happens and how and why we're really able to live life in the Spirit and be immersed in the Holy Spirit of truth is because now we no longer have to sin. You see, there's this thing about sin. You have no choice in it. <laughs> when we're born as a baby, and as we grow up, we live in sin. It's just natural. It's our birthright. In Adam all die. We're born with that sin nature. But now Jesus makes a way that we don't have to live in sin, but we can now live a different way, a way that honors God, and I think quickly, just turn with me quickly. I want you to look at this in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. Because this is a real beautiful uh, way to talk about who we were and then who we are in this new life, immersed in the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 to 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. You see, you're born again, not to live your own disgusting, sinful way, but we're now alive to God so that we might live a different way. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Insert your sin here. This is not an exhaustive list of the fallenness of man. Trust me, I think we're creating new sins every day. Okay? But God now makes a way. We don't have to live that way as Christians. See, some Christians live and still just live in their same sins. And maybe they know, and they're just babies in Christ. But the full, abundant life, what it means to be alive, is we no longer have to walk that way. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They used to love partying with me. I was the life of the party before I came to the Lord. And I don't want to rehearse all of the sins that were common for me, but, but I was just doing what was natural, but I thought it was fun. We had fun, fleeting fun, but this is real fun. This is really being alive, being who God's called us to be. I suspect we've all heard the nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. What a sad, sad nursery rhyme. Poor Humpty, an egg just splattered on the ground. Who can help Humpty Dumpty? We all in Adam are Humpty Dumpty. We all in Adam are broken and splattered. Maybe this king and the king's horses couldn't help Humpty, but God has sent his son, the king, to put us back together, to restore us. What a blessing. So we don't see the Holy Spirit, folks, but we see the effects of it. The effects of it is it takes a broken sinner like you and I, and the Holy Spirit 
comes to make us new. It's a guarantee that we've been forgiven, and it's the power to live and truly be alive like, and he truly is, Gary Miracle, uh, from my original story there. Let me just read Abraham Kuyper quickly. Uh, Kuyper has a great uh, book on the Holy Spirit, and just talking about the effects of the Holy Spirit, not seeing the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is seen through the changed life of the believer. He says this, the rays of light hidden in the sun are indivisible and indistinguishable until they radiate. So in the being of God, the indwelling working is one and undivided. His personal glories remain invisible until revealed in his outgoing work. A stream is one until it falls over the precipice and divides into many drops. So is the life of God, one and undivided, well hidden within himself. But when it is poured out into created things, its colors stand revealed. When the Holy Spirit is poured out into us, created things, right? New birth is wonderful. Uh, excuse me, birth is wonderful. Birthdays are wonderful. We celebrated Michelle yesterday. The, all of her daughters put glowing uh, uh, recognition of, of what their mom is to her, is to them. I made her breakfast in bed because I appreciate her. I love her. We celebrate birthdays. We've got a lot of folks here that are going to have birthdays soon. Louisa and Katie. Um, man, I'm going to miss them all. Ted has a birthday coming up. I wrote him here somewhere. Who's got a birthday in May? John Cooper was one I missed. You're going to have a nice birthday cake, right, Louisa? Hopefully they're going to celebrate Louisa that day. And it's wonderful as we celebrated Michelle, and hopefully all you're appreciated. But you know what? There's nothing more exciting that we should truly be celebrating than what God has done in Christ in us. Amen. God has appointed the day of our first birth, and he's appointed the day of our second birth. And that second birth is so much more wonderful. And you know how we celebrate it? By living the life that he's given us in the Holy Spirit, immersed in the Holy Spirit. We declare Michelle on, on May 1st and we celebrate her. Well, you know what? Every day is new birthday in Christ. And how we celebrate is by giving testimony to what God's done within us, right? So my final point is the idea of testifying to the truth. Acts 19.6-7 says, And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and they prophesied. You know what they prophesied? The wonderful works of God. They declared God's greatness as they did on uh, Pentecost. But I want to just give you one illustration of a story. In this story, I think really... You know, we talked about Gary Miracle. Well, I want to talk about that, that Gadarene young man, the guy that lived in the country of the Gadarenes. He was oppressed by demon, many demons. He would run around naked and he lived in tombs. This guy was a hot mess before Jesus came into his life. It says, for it had often seized him and he kept under guard. He was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Sad, eh? This is the picture of people without Christ. This, we are shackled in sin, and chains bind us. We break those off and we go crazy. But when Jesus comes into our life, he changes us. He makes us new. But what I want to see at the end of this story is that this young man now has a testimony. And I'd ask each of us, do we have a testimony of what Christ has done in our lives? Are we declaring what Christ has done, what Jesus has done? Listen, if you're a Christian and you don't have a testimony, you're just living. You need to know what it's like to really be alive. Luke 8, 38 to 39 says this, Now the man from whom the demons had, had departed begged him, Jesus, that he might be with him. I'm with that. Are you kidding me? This guy has lived in hell his whole life. 
This guy has been tormented every day. Jesus delivers me? I want to be like a puppy dog. I want to follow Jesus everywhere he goes. But what does Jesus say to him? Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus has done for him. He has an amazing testimony about what Jesus had done. And I'm sure it will be his story until glory, right? Mm -hmm. To tell that old, old story of Jesus and his love. This is what we're here to be living examples and testimonies to. This truth of love poured out on us in Christ. It's a wonderful thing. Here's, here's the birthdays. Ted, Katie, Ryan, John Cooper, Greg Phillips. Happy birthday this month. I got them out of whack here, but I finally got them. Um, but so uh, what's important, I think, in the base of our story is that, that, that there is truth, the truth of the gospel. There is true truth of God's word, what we should be living and doing. But more than that, God is creating a testimony in our lives. God has changed us for a purpose, for a reason. What's the main purpose, Sarah, that we live? We live for the glory of God, right? The Westminster Confession, for why is man be created? That we might glorify God and enjoy him forever. You know how God is most glorified? By the, our changed lives. I don't even nearly reflect who I once was. I remember Michelle once saying, you're an alien in the good way. And all of us should be aliens for Christ. So, what? without any further ado, I have always struggled to come up with a good illustration. A story that will explain what my sermon's trying to say. And what I'm trying to say is that through the power of the gospel, we are changed, we have new life, and we have a testimony. So we're called to give testimony to Christ. And today is exactly what we're going to be able to see and hear from my son-in-law, Trevor. I know Trevor. I know him when he met my daughter. I know him when he married my daughter. I know when I used to chase him around and beg him to not make some mistakes that he was making. And I think Michelle had the pleasure of really sharing the gospel with Trevor when he originally came to the Lord. Um, and now I know Trevor, and he has a testimony. He's a different man. Uh, I, I know Ralph, and I know Barb, and I weren't there, wasn't there to know you before you knew Christ, but I'm kind of thankful I know you after Christ, because I see the living testimony that you both are, um, and, and it's glorious. So we as a congregation voted last week. I, 